Beloved congregation, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9. I'd like to read verses 25 through 27. Genesis chapter 9, verse 25 through verse 27. Then Noah said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Dear congregation, we've come to the final section of Noah, our final sermon on Noah. And so far, it seems that there has been something missing. Something important. Something we would expect to hear. What am I talking about? Children, do you know what I'm talking about? What's been missing as we've gone through this story so far? Well, so far in this whole story that's centered on this important man in history, we've not yet heard him speak. That's pretty surprising. After all that Noah's been through, there hasn't yet been a single recorded word of Noah. Uh, No post-flood interview. uh, Noah, can you please tell me what it's like to uh, survive all of that? Just put it into words. We haven't heard anything what it was like to be a first inhabitant on this new world. No words. Uh, Seven times we've read that God spoke to Noah, but not once have we heard Noah say anything. That's surprising. This ought to be jarring as we read this story. And this becomes even more remarkable when we remember what Peter calls Noah. 2 Peter 2, verse 5, Noah is a preacher of righteousness. And children, you know what preachers do, don't you? Uh, They do different things, but one thing they do is they open their mouth and they speak, and sometimes it seems like they don't stop speaking. Uh, They preach. We haven't heard Noah speak yet. Until now. And all of this then highlights the significance of what Noah is about to say. He hasn't said a word, and now here finally Noah speaks, and this is exciting then because I want to hear him speak, and yet as you look at these words, you're probably thinking this is not the sermon he wants recorded. I mean, if you had one sermon recorded for history, John Knox had two. There's only two written sermons of John Knox. But if you only had one sermon recorded, I mean, you look at these words and you think, well, I probably don't want it to be that. What is Noah talking about? Our text is confusing on first read, and it has become the occasion for much misunderstanding and sadly even destructive interpretations. And so let me start by telling you how not to hear Noah the preacher. How not, and I'm underscoring that, how not to hear Noah the preacher. The first point that Noah is not making is that racism is warranted. Here's how the faulty reasoning goes. Ham is cursed. Black people come from Ham. Therefore, black people are cursed. And their subjection is therefore justified. I see it right here in the Bible. Sadly, we can listen to preachers say that uh, in not too distant history. Iveson Brooks, a Baptist preacher who lived in the 1800s in America, he preached this, along with many others. uh, Just an illustration of what was commonly taught. This is what he said. It's hard to hear, I hope. Negro slavery is an institution of heaven intended for the mutual benefit of master and slave as proved by the Bible. Looking at this text. God himself authorized Noah to doom the posterity of Ham. Friends, that's a terrible twisting of scripture. I think we see that now looking back. But it shows us how easily we can use the Bible to justify our sins. Praise God, it was other Bible believers who were correcting these preachers and preaching the truth, which ultimately led to the long fight that ended in the freedom for black slaves. 
So let's be abundantly clear. This passage is not teaching that racism is warranted. Uh, The great preacher, Jim Boyce, he wrote, this is without any biblical basis and is a proof rather of the expositor's sin. First of all, notice it's not Ham who's cursed, nor all of the sons of Ham who's cursed, only Canaan. And so even if we were to say, and we're not going to say that, but even if we were to say that Ham is the father of all those who lived in Africa, only one of his four sons were cursed. Therefore, it's completely wrong and evil to make some wide sweeping statement that black people are cursed. And second, far more importantly, as we'll see, Canaan wasn't cursed because of dark skin, but because of a dark heart, a sin-stained heart. And so if anything, this passage reminds us there's only one human race. We're all descendants of Noah. And all of us do our fallen nature in Adam have a dark, evil heart. So no to the racist interpretation of this passage. That is not what Noah is preaching. But there's a second, probably more common interpretive issue of our day. And that is Christ is missing. That's not what Noah is preaching. He's not preaching a Christless sermon here. We can read it that way. Uh, Just some vague pronouncement of blessing and cursing with no reference to the central storyline of Scripture. Uh, we, We don't connect this at all to what God has been doing since Genesis 3 and does until the end of the book, Revelation 22. We don't connect it, and so we don't see any Christ here. Well, that's not how to hear Noah. Noah is a preacher of righteousness, And remember how Paul framed his gospel, uh, the whole of Romans, the clearest exposition of the gospel is framed as the gospel of Christ, the gospel of righteousness. Uh, Romans 1 verse 16, what the text that lit the Reformation on fire, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek, for in it, that's in the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And so as I come to this text, and, I, and the Bible tells me, Noah is a preacher of righteousness, and it's in the context of God's word, I'm... I'm expecting that his sermon here is going to be full of gospel hope. And if that's your expectation, you won't be let down. This is Noah's gospel sermon. That's our title, Noah's gospel sermon. And we have two points uh, this morning. First, good news for God's people. Good news for God's people. Verse 25 Then Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And I'm saying it's in this verse that we find good news for God's people, and I think that means I have some explaining to do. Here's the key to understanding this verse. We need to remember the historical context of when this revelation is being given to God's people. Who wrote the book of Genesis? It's Moses. And remember, God spoke these words through Moses then to his recently redeemed people. Uh, God has just taken them out of Egypt, out of bondage, and in a wonderful display of power and grace, he's now been leading them through the wilderness. And where are they going? They're on their way to Canaan, to the promised land. And they've been called to go there and conquer the land of Canaan. And that's when God gives Genesis 9, 25. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And so the first bit of good news we're seeing here for God's people is the good news of God's justice. The good news of God's justice. And this is very good news. Because imagine how awful it would be to to serve an immoral, fickle deity that was malicious, tyrannical, and arbitrary. Uh, That's the God of of e- the gods of Egypt were like, uh, were like that. The gods of Can- the Canaanites were like that. Just fickle, arbitrary. The wind's blowing this way and the gods are doing this today, I guess. That would be awful. God's not like that. And he wants his people to know, I'm not like that. I- I'm not just telling you to go wipe out the people of Canaan for no rhyme or no reason. My justice is not arbitrary. No, God is just and that means there is a foundation then for good and evil. 
If God is not just, we are trapped in a universe where everyday meaningless acts of terror are committed, and there's no accounting of it, no final reckoning, and that is the end point of an atheistic worldview, and that's not the end point of the Christian worldview. Because the good news is that the universe we live in is not that way. There is a holy God who is judge, and he is just. Now, of course, God doesn't have to explain his ways to little creatures like us. But in his kindness, he loves to let his people in on his plans and some of his reasoning. And that's part of the purpose here of this text. As Israel, then, is marching through the sandy deserts. And children, as we come to Genesis 9, 25, that's what you should picture is the Israelites hearing it for the first time as they're walking to Canaan. And this text is telling them that they are about to be used as God's sword of just justice to destroy the Canaanites. And this text then is meant to prepare them for that task. Let me explain. In, In this verse, God is essentially saying, here are the type of people you're about to confront. And that's why I notice in the previous verses, it kept referring to Ham as the father of Canaan. And so the point here is God is wanting his people to realize they're not going to be facing off with some innocent group of peoples who deserve blessing. No, no, no. Ham's sin of delighting in the nakedness of his father is illustrating for us what Canaan and the Canaanites are like. Uh, Here's their origin story. And, And congregation, we know what it's like Uh, how children can so often pick up habits from their parents, whether for good or for ill. We say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And God is saying to his people, well, Canaan is a rotten apple. And look it, he's not falling too far from the rotten apple tree of Ham. And so the Canaanites, they got worse and worse by the time Israel got there. Hundreds of years have passed since the days of Noah. In fact, uh, historians today consider the paganism found in ancient Egypt, the place that Israel has just left, they consider that paganism to be conservative compared to the paganism found in Canaan. One scholar writes this, Canaanite religion was evidently the most sexually depraved of any in the ancient world. And so God here is essentially saying to Israel, as they prepare to conquer Canaan, look at what their father was like. This is how their story starts. He's a rotten tree, and now get ready. You're about to see rotten fruit, people who are ripe for judgment. Uh, This is not God's judgment falling on the innocent. This is God's just judgment falling on the wicked. Maybe as you've read through Deuteronomy, you've wondered, why does God need to get so specific with some of his laws? For example, telling his people not to commit horrific things like bestiality or child sacrifice? The answer is because that's what's happening in Canaan. Uh, They are, we might say, even darker than what we're seeing pushed today. That's how dark Canaan is the days the Israelites leave. Uh, leave Egypt and head to that promised land. And so that helps us. When we remember the context, that helps us remember God's purpose for giving the text. Um, Genesis 9 and 25 is not at all excusing Noah's behavior as if there's no consequences to his sin. No, no. uh, His sin brings division on the family. Sin always has consequences, but that's not the focus of this text. Uh, This text doesn't strive to answer all the questions either. For example, why is Canaan cursed, not Ham? Now, certainly we could say that's a mercy of God. He could have judged Ham and then all four sons, but he only judged one. It's possible that the punishment is reflecting the crime. As a son, Ham sinned against his father. Now, as a father, his son will sin against him. His son is cursed. But all of that is really secondary and missing the point. The main point of this verse is to illustrate for God's people the kind of evil behavior they're about to meet in Canaan. And therefore, God wants his people to know the conquest of the land is not a genocide of innocent people. It's an exercise of the Lord's just judgment towards a desperately wicked people after centuries of patience from God. Judgment is not something God jumps to. He is slow to anger. And yet the wickedness has reached a point that judgment was inevitable. 
And so yes, Noah's sermon so far, it's good news for God's people. They are serving a just God as they go through the wilderness. But there's a second bit of good news for God's people, and it's this, the good news of guaranteed victory. Uh, and this is where the applications for us really start to hit home, the good news of guaranteed victory. Notice verse 25, then he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. Now just pause again, you're in the, da- uh, the dusty, sandy desert, and you've just heard this word through Moses from God, a servant of servants Canaan shall be to his brethren. And what encouragement that's meant to give you of the guaranteed victory God is holding out in his people's conquest. God is saying to his people, you don't need to be afraid. You can go in, you can go conquer this land because I am guaranteeing you the victory. In congregation, there are, as I said, important applications here for us. Of course, with Israel, it was a physical fight with a physical victory and a physical occupation of a physical land. Uh, This was a specific event not to be repeated in the history of redemption. And here we are living in the new covenant era. And yet I assure you, we still have enemies to fight. But these, of course, are spiritual enemies to be fought with spiritual weapons. Ephesians 6, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so let me ask you the important question. Dear Christian, how is your fight of sanctification going? Be honest and look at your life. This morning, are you living under a cloud of defeat? These temptations are too strong or my indwelling sin is too persistent. I want victory, but it's unattainable. I feel powerless. I can't make any progress. And so it's not worth fighting. Dear believer, this is exactly where Satan wants us. And we know it's so easy to get discouraged and to give up the fight. Remember Israel? They even had this promise the promise of victory, and yet they dared not face their enemies on the other side of the border. They got to the border of Canaan, and they turned around. They they fled. Our enemies are too strong. Their soldiers are too big. Their chariots are too fearsome. Uh, Their walls are too entrenched. Uh, We won't win, so we won't bother fighting. And Israel's unbelief and disobedience cost them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And dear believer, the Lord is asking us, he's searching us, is this, has this been our attitude this week? In the fight of sanctification. Yes, the fight is fierce. Yes, it can seem impossible. And yet God calls us to march forward. And that's actually the key to victory in the Christian life. By faith, marching forward one step at a time. It's through faith we lay hold of God as he comes to us in his promises, and it's that way that we gain victory over our sin. It's through faith that we put on the armor of God. It's through faith that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christian, what God is reminding us here is that Christ has won the victory over sin. He has dealt the decisive blow, and so we will have the ultimate victory in the end. Uh, The gates to Canaan have been opened to the heavenly Canaan. Right now, we're fighting a defeated enemy. So again, the Lord asks us, are you battling sin from a posture of confidence in Christ? Romans 6, verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, to sin's power, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the good news of victory. And it's from that reality, that That Christ has done something, I'm united to Christ by faith, therefore sin's power has been broken, and I'm to reckon myself this way, that I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. From that reality, I press on in the fight by faith. Verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That's what it wants to do. It wants to take the crown again and get over your life, over your heart, and rule over you. And yet the good news here is that God has promises that assure us 
that victory is guaranteed. One day, uh, sanctification will be done. It's not worthless fighting. We must press on in the fight. Keep marching, keep going by faith in these great promises. That's the good news for God's people. But second, there's good news for the nations here. Good news for the nations. And this is where Noah's gospel sermon really surges forward to a whole new level of good news. Uh, Verse 26, then he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And so notice we're moving here from the curse to the blessing. And there's something quite remarkable here. Uh, Noah has pronounced a curse on Canaan, and we would then expect him to pronounce a blessing on Shem and Japheth. And notice that's not what happens. Cursed be Canaan. Blessed be the Lord. And that's a crucial point that many people miss uh, when we come to this passage. The focus of interpretation here, the focus of Noah's, Noah's sermon is on the Lord. Do you see that? Blessed be the Lord. The Lord is the focal point for his sermon, and he is the reason there is good news for you and I and for all nations today. Blessed be the Lord. Noah's singing. Uh, he's pronouncing this doxology. It's a, it's a prayer of praise and this prophecy of earnest expectation in the Lord. So, congregation, this text, it's much bigger than just a family division and, and Ham, you're the bad son, and so your son gets the curse, and uh, Shem and Japheth, you're the good sons, and so here, here's a reward for you. No, it's much bigger than that. This is all about God's plan to rescue this sinful, cursed world. That's how we're meant to read these words. God's plan to rescue the sinful, cursed world. Um, We won't understand this text unless it leads us to praising the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Unless we're saying that by the end of this, of Noah's sermon, we won't have understood it. Blessed be the Lord for his great saving works. Notice in this text, Noah is saying, there's only one hope for the nations, and it's the Lord. And there's blessings for all those who are in a relationship with that God. Do you see it? Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And congregation, what good news is packed into this name of God? Because this here, for the very first time on the pages of Scripture, God is referred to as the God of someone. He's the God of Shem. This means he's not the God who is distant. Um, He's not the God who's far removed from this world and from our lives. No, he's the God of Shem, the God who associates with people. Yes, the God who made everything as the creator, who rules over everything as king, and yet he's the God of Shem. He associates with people even more. He's the God who binds himself to sinful people. He's the God of Shem. He's the Lord. You see that name? That's a name that's packed full of these two ideas, relationship and redemption. And so friends, if this news doesn't want to make you sing, then you haven't quite understood Noah's message yet. Uh, It's at this point that the hearty amens might be coming out in Noah's sermon uh, as he's focusing our attention to the Lord. Uh, Shem wasn't special in and of himself. He had the same fallen human nature that you and I. And yet notice, God is not ashamed to be called his God. What's the good news this morning? Well, it's this. Maybe you're here and you're in distress because you know you're a sinner. And so you think, well, I'm here today, but I don't really want to be here maybe even because there's nothing here for me. I'm a sinner. What's there for me here? Well, there's good news for you here. Uh, God is the God of Shem. God is the God of sinners. That's what this text is telling us. He's the redeemer. He's exactly who you need today. And he's here already in Genesis. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you're here and you feel alone. you feel beat up in this world, isolated, no one cares for you, you feel you're drift in a sea of anxiety and trouble. There's good news for you too, friend. God is the God of Shem. He doesn't just redeem sinners. 
but he actually relates to sinners. He's, he's the greatest friend of sinners. Uh, he's the God who walked with sinful Noah. He's the God who's going to walk with this Shem. And so Psalm 144, verse 15, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Truly blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Now, maybe you say, well, that's great for, for Shem, but how do I know that God can be my God too? And that's verse 27 then. Now, what continues? May God enlarge Japheth, may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now, grammatically, there's two ways to read this text. Here's the first one. It's the one that most people assume is the right reading. It goes like this. May God enlarge Japheth, and may Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be Japheth's servant. That is grammatically possible, but there is a better reading of this text that actually connects this verse to the whole storyline of Scripture and to the immediate context of the focus on the Lord. And you read it like this, and uh, there's other commentators. Um, Dr. Michael Barrett from PRTS has a helpful book uh, on finding Christ in the Old Testament, and he translates it this way. May God enlarge Japheth, and may God dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be God's servant. The pronouns, congregation, are pointing to the Lord. He's the fountainhead of all blessing, and he's the reason for hope. And so from this, we see three glorious promises in this verse. The first one is there's an identification. Identification. The gospel up to this point is that there's a seed of the woman who's going to come and crush the head of the serpent. But here, notice God is further, further narrowing the identity of that seed. Lord, where should we look? Where, where is this human savior coming from? It's going to be a son of, of Eve, seed of the woman, but, but where is he going to come from? And this text tells us, Noah tells us, God will dwell in the tents of Shem. Um, the savior, the seed, won't just come from Eve, but he'll come from the family of Shem. This is, this is a narrowing down of the identification of the Messiah. Through Noah, God is saying, I'm still firmly committed to this plan of salvation. And as you read into the next chapters, you'll see that this actually really is the focus of God. Because as you get to Genesis 10, 11, and 12, you find God tracing out the lineage of Shem until Genesis 12, we get to Abraham. And here is God then narrowing the seed. He's promised Abraham a seed. The Savior is going to come from you, Abraham, the Shemite. And then later we keep reading in Genesis and the line is narrowed down to Judah. And then we keep reading and it's narrowed down to David. And then the long wait all the way until Jesus arrives. True man, son of the Virgin Mary, legally adopted son of Joseph, and yet in reality, the eternal son of God. And that's the next amazing thing here in this gospel sermon. Notice Noah makes the first prophecy of the incarnation. The incarnation, God will dwell in the tents of Shem. The Savior is not just the son of Shem, a human, but it's God himself. Uh, and he will dwell in our tents. He will rescue us. And again, picture yourself in the desert, having just been redeemed from Egypt by who? By Moses? No, no, no. By God. And look at God. He's dwelling in the tents of Shem. You see his tent there? The tabernacle. He's the type of God who dwells in our midst. This is amazing. And then you get to the temple, and it's, he's, he's established a place here in our midst. He's, his house isn't going anywhere. It's built of stone. And then you get the curveball of the ex exile, but for 500 years, Israel is removed from their land and that house went somewhere. It was destroyed. When is God going to dwell in our midst again? And you get to the Gospels, John 1, 14, and we find the fulfillment of Noah's sermon. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He dwelt in the tents of Shem. The eternal God has come to dwell in, among us in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And maybe then, most surprising, flowing from this, Noah speaks of this great inclusion. This great inclusion. Is there a gospel for Shem? Is there a gospel for Japheth? Is there a gospel even for Ham's descendants, for a Canaan? This text emphatically says yes. May God enlarge Japheth. May God dwell in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be God's servant. Congregation Noah here is announcing God's global mission. The line of Shem is chosen so that the seed, the savior of the world would come from Shem, but that savior would not merely be a savior for Shem and his people. He would be the savior of the world. Abraham heard the same news just three chapters later. Abraham, in you, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God had a global mission from the start. And so Calvin writes this, the calling of the Gentiles is not only decreed in the eternal counsel of God, but is openly declared by the mouth of the patriarch Noah. Lest we should think it, have to, it to have happened suddenly or by chance that the inheritance of eternal life was offered generally to all. Calvin saying, if you're reading your Bible rightly, you won't be surprised when we get to the New Testament and the mission goes to the Gentiles. The gospel is good news for everyone if we've been following the story. And congregation, this good news is good news that doesn't skip past the reality of God's curse and the reality of God's judgment. No, no, it's good news for those who are under the curse and for those facing judgment. Galatians 3, verse 10, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's all of us, whether we're from Shem, Ham, or Japheth. Galatians 3, 13, a couple of verses later, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that, f that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Congregation, you see Jesus here being preached by Noah? He is the fulfillment of all these things. Uh, he is the one for whom, for our sakes, became the servant of servants. Uh, Canaan, you will be the servant of servants, the lowest of the lowest. And then Jesus comes onto the scene, Mark 10, 45, even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve, even to serve the woman from Cana and, and the, 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 the Gentiles who came to him. I've come to serve them and to give myself as a ransom for many. Creation, this was God's plan all along. Noah believes it for himself, and he preaches it to others. And because of this, as we read through the Bible, there are even Canaanites who are being blessed. Yes, judgment is coming on the wicked. God is just. That's a frightening thing if you're apart from him. If you're apart from him today, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But take the story of the prostitute Rahab. Judgment is knocking on her door. Judgment is surrounding her city. And here is Rahab living in a sexually deviant culture, had the reputation in that culture for being one of the worst. She's the, the town prostitute, a Canaanite. You know what God does? He saves her. He saves her. He forgives her. He washes her. He changes her. And then what? Keeps her on the fringe of the community? No, no. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make her, the Canaanite, one of Christ's great-grandmothers, this is what God loves to do. He saves sinners, he changes sinners, and then he enlists them into his service. Christ became the servant of all, but as we are now united to God in Christ, we become his humble servants. This is what he turns us into. And that's not a derogatory thing. This is an honorable thing. The prime minister is the first servant of the king. And God, through Christ, has made every Christian a prime minister his first servant, as it were, a, an honorable title, slaves of Christ, and yet to be a humble servant of the Lord is better than to live in the tents of wickedness. Dear friends, this is Noah's gospel. It's the good news of the free grace of God in Christ, 
Noah knows the blessedness of being forgiven. It's right on the heels of his drunkenness that God raises him up to preach the spirit-filled, Christ-centered sermon. Noah knows the blessedness of forgiveness. He knows that God is the only hope for him, for his sons, and for this world. And congregation, the gospel is the same today. Uh, It's the same story. Behold your God. Blessed be the Lord, the Redeemer, the God who has relationship with sinners. Come to this God. Find your rest in this God. Find your refuge in this God. And you will be saved. You have good news for yourself yourself. 